Hello and welcome to another session with me. And as you all know, my name is Jay. And in the past, I have been going live or maybe presenting content for the Gen Z in the branding of Let's Talk Gen Z. And this is the very first edition of LinkedIn Live, which we are going to use. And in today's session, we have with us one of the experts and one of the leading professionals from the medtech world and the regulatory world of medical devices, uh, who is famously known as Greer Deal. And hi, Greer, I hope you are doing well. I am, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's great, that's lovely. So before we move on, I will just like to let our audience know what is going to happen in today's session. So in today's session, we are going to understand what exactly EUMDR is all about. So the medical device regulations have changed in the Europe. And it's going to be interesting because with the onset of pandemic and having so much traction around healthcare, these regulations are going to help us understand why there is a change and what are the new impacts on the medical devices. So before we go into the session, I will like Greer, you to just share something more about Medidia and your work at GRS, because I see that you are the director of those companies and you could just brief us and our audience to know a little bit more of what you do at Medidia and at GRS. Thank you very much, Jay, and thanks for this opportunity to talk today. <laughs> So, so yes, um, Global Regulatory Services was founded about 14 years ago, um, focusing on uh, regulatory affairs and quality compliance across the whole of the life sciences and global, the clues in the name. So, um, and then a couple of years ago, um, we decided to spin out another consultancy and that's when mm -hmm. Medidia was born. And that consultancy is, is here to focus on the med tech sector and that came about because of demand from companies. We were getting so many inquiries um, for, for a very specialist regulatory and quality compliance support from medical technology companies. So we wanted to be able to have a group of people who could focus purely on that. And um, because of Brexit, I have to mention it, and no doubt we'll talk about it, that a bit more later, we also wanted to have a presence in Europe as well as in the UK. And so we chose Ireland because it's not too far away. Um, and also um, myself and the other director fell in love with Galway, which is actually where the media is placed. So again, that, um, that is a company that focuses on regulatory affairs and quality compliance, but has the full support of GRS, Global Regulatory Services, with that global network of in-country specialists. Oh, that's interesting. And yes, just for the information of the audience, I am employed by one of the companies. I work with Medidia as the communications officer. And this is a good opportunity for even me to interact better with the directors of my company. So yes, it's going to be interesting to talk directly with you on a public forum and to host you. So as you all know that the European Commission uh, in the year 2017, if I'm not wrong, came up with the medical device regulation, which is known as MDR. And then due to the pandemic, it was shifted and it was being implemented in 2021. And today is the day when MDR is coming into action. So, Greer, I would just like to understand why is there a new medical device regulation? What is the need and why do we have it? Yeah, there's several reasons, actually. Um, one is because previously we had the, um, the medical device directive and, um, and basically the science and technology that is now uh, underpinning all the medical devices that are out there has become ever more complicated. And then the old medical device directive was no longer fit for purpose. So that's one reason. The other reason is that we've had quite a few scandals in the medtech sector. So if you mm -hmm. remember, there was the PIP, so the, the breast implants, um, using industrial grade silicon in the breast implants. We also had the metal on metal hips and a whole raft of everything else. And what, it, what those scandals actually identified was that there was a lack of control over the whole supply chain if you think about it, a lot of pharmaceutical companies, um, they are in, in complete control of the development of the drug, the manufacturing of it, um, and the, the sale and, and marketing of it. 
with medical device companies, by their very nature, the device itself is often made of several different components. And those components are sourced from anywhere in the world. And what a lot of companies were doing where they were accepting at face value the quality of those components to put into their final product, the final device, which was to be placed on the European market. And thinking about the, the breast implant um, scandal itself, it, high, it, it clearly demonstrated there was a complete lack of control over the supply chain. I mean, industrial, industrial grade silicon is not good news, but it also demonstrated that they they didn't know where some of the um, components actually came from. So, so now the medical device regulation um, is about risk and mitigating risk. So it's identifying risk and mitigating that risk and making sure there's complete control over, over the supply chain. And yes. with the new medical device regulation, the authorities, the notified bodies, can actually audit anyone in that supply chain. So, okay. and, they can, and they can pitch up unannounced as well. So everybody's got to be prepared. And now the final manufacturer, the legal manufacturer, must make sure and, and actually carry out proper due diligence on everyone in their supply chain to make sure that each component is up to the standard that it should be. And that's why oh, we have the new medical yeah. device regulation. <laughs> so yes no doubt it is very important because I, I i can see that the scandals and all of that have been expanding a lot and there is an ever-growing threat in cyber security so i feel somewhere the mdr will be adding value to that as well and what i you know as as a young person and many of the audience in today's session they are very new to the career and they are very young and they don't have much idea about what's going on. So I would just, you know, for the audience, audience's understanding, I would just like to know that what is the difference maybe when we talk about a directive and a regulation? Because initially it was medical device directives, which was MDD, and now it is MDR. So what and why is it regulations and what is the difference between both of them? Yeah, that's a very good question, Jay. So directive is um, a, a type of regulation, which sounds a bit confusing, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's, um, a, it's a type of regulation which is adopted into each of the country's own law, but they mm -hmm. can interpret it in their own way. So you okay. can, even though on paper it looks like the directive is you know, is harmonized across the board. It isn't, and each member state can actually make a slight change to it according to what they believe are their own requirements. So the other reason why we have this medical device regulation is to actually harmonize the requirements across Europe. And as a regulation, it doesn't, it, it's supposed to mitigate any misunderstanding and any, any misinterpretation. So, and that regulation goes straight into law across the whole of Europe. Um, so it's supposed to help with understanding. It's supposed to um, prevent any particular country specific nuances. Um, so th the, main th the main take home story here or message is harmonization. Regulation means harmonization. Directive, it's open to interpretation. Oh, so that, that is something important because in, a, in, a, in the U union, it is important that all the states follow a similar guidelines because it could be an issue for the manufacturers as well as the regulators. So I, I believe that somewhere, oh, I can see there are comments flooding in for us. And I'm just on the screen here uh, on the side where I'm checking on the uh, comments. And I guess people are excited for the, the, for the questions. <laughs> so that's, that's something good. Hello, audience. We are listening to you. And if you have any questions, you could just pop them up in the comment section. And we might take it up for discussion towards the end of the session. So, and you know, the 2019, uh, the year COVID-19 struck, the beginning of the pandemic, and it somewhere has brought a massive change in the entire 
um, maybe I can say organization of the world and how things are operating. So I did see that some similar traction was built in the implementation of MDR. So MDR was supposed to be implemented in 2019, if I'm not wrong, and they are getting implemented today in 2021. So do you think, was it a blessing in disguise? Right. I'm going to give you a typical regulatory answer, and it depends. <laughs> it depends on where you are, whether you're a regulator, whether you're an industry, etc. It, it was um, just to make it clear, it was supposed to be implemented last year, and it, and because of COVID, it was delayed by another year. <clears throat> and just to clarify my answer, um, we have regulators. Um, called notified bodies throughout Europe, and they act on behalf of the main regulator, um, which is called the competent authority. Now, there's this interesting mechanism that um, we have numerous notified bodies, and they're all designated, as we call it, under the medical device directive. But then they have to go through this whole process of being designated, or you could say approved, under the medical device regulation. Because the regulation is more complex and more stringent, um, a number of notified bodies have decided that they're not going to be designated under MDR. Um, the other thing that's happened is it's taking a long time to go through this approval process. So we've now got this very small pool of approved, let's say, notified bodies. There's a huge list, waiting list of, of companies trying to be audited, trying to get CE marks, trying to get their technical files reviewed by this smaller pool of notified bodies. So by delaying the, the full implementation of medical device regulation by another year, that's actually bought the authorities more time, as well mm -hmm. as the industry. The industry have now have had another year to, to transition to, to the medical device regulation. But there's been a knock-on effect because even though there's been a delay, some areas of the medical device regulation was actually coming into force anyway. So we've got the system called Udemed, which is supposed to be a centralized um, electronic system of registering all these devices. Um, and you know they will all have their unique device identifiers and that will all be registered on, on Udemed. So that's being brought in step by step, but it's now out of sync with the implementation of medical device regulation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are complexities. And then in the middle of all this, Brexit happened, and that's caused even more complexities for companies who are who are located in the UK. <laughs> No doubt to that Brexit and the pandemic, all of that coming together has somewhere affected the European market and the UK market in a great way. And maybe being in Ireland, I can see the changes and the impact and the impact on the supply chain that is happening. So, yes, that ch the change is evident. We cannot do anything and the new regulations are coming in. So it's going to happen some of the other day. So we all were prepared for it. But maybe my, the audience today, they would be interested in knowing what are the top changes because as we are transitioning from directives to regulations and now it is going to be implemented throughout the European Union and it wouldn't be changing as the directives. So what are the top changes or maybe top points of highlight, spotlight in the MDR that is coming in today? With the MDR, there's a lot more emphasis on clinical evidence, and that's clinical evidence to support any claims for the medical device that is being sold in Europe. And um, I, I know from direct experience, even the multinationals, I mean, they have thousands of devices, and a lot of them are very old. And um, they've been scrambling around for the last three, four years, trying to find the clinical data that supports the claims which are attached to their medical devices. And it's actually meant that a number of these devices are going to be, have already been withdrawn from the market because they don't have that clinical evidence. So there's a lot more evidence, a, a lot more emphasis on clinical evidence. And that's at any risk classification. 
So devices are split um, or, or categorized um, by their level of risk. So you've got your class one medical device, very, very low risk. That's like your crutches, things like that, wheelchairs. Um, and then you go right up to the maximum um, risk classification, which is a class three. So that's implantables. Um, that's where um, maybe there's a com combination with a medicine. So the clinical evidence has to be provided no matter what the risk classification. Now in the good old days, as some people would say, under the directive, class one device manufacturers used to actually just put their product onto the market and then say, actually, we'll catch up with the evidence later. So it was put it on the market first and then sort out the technical file and clinical evidence um, at, at another point. But we're all humans and, you know, you don't spend the time. If, if you're not, if there's no incentive, people just are not going to um, you know, work hard at getting that evidence. So now with the regulation, even though the class one device manufacturers, it's still self-notification, there is a lot more emphasis on that clinical evidence. And you have to be able to prove that what your device, what you're saying your device can do actually does what you're saying it does. Um, and when I say clinical evidence, it's a combination of running your own clinical investigations. So if you're in pharmaceuticals, that would be like a trial, but with medical devices, but also looking at literature um, and any information that you may have gathered through the development and the design of your own device. And you bring that all together and you put that into a clinical evaluation report. So that's one key area. The, the other key area is risk management. Everything is about risk. So every um, medical device manufacturer must identify risk and then put a plan of action in that addresses that risk to make sure that your device is as safe as possible. So those are the key, oh, okay. key, two key areas. <laughs> yes, as a manufacturer, I guess if they have to keep a key eye on that. And now I, I can see a lot of traction is even built on our site. We have a good amount of audience and they are commenting and uh, hello everyone once again and yeah it is really exciting for me that you are supporting me on the very first LinkedIn live and you are loving the session I can see people are writing it as insightful and informative session so yes uh, and we will be coming up regularly in this manner with different guests and a wide variety of people who will be talking more and more enlightening everyone out there so I moving back to the session, I somewhere, you know, being in Ireland, I feel that the Brexit has brought good amount of implication and things have changed. But in this change, UK is still UK still follows the old tradition, maybe like the MDD guidelines, and they are not transitioning into this MDR. So do you think there are any plans by UK? because of the Brexit, because even we have medical device manufacturers all across the globe. So do you think that there is any plan by UK to transition or how are they planning to adopt to this MDR? So yeah, this is a really interesting scenario. And this goes back to a question you actually asked earlier um, in that because the medical device regulation was delayed by another year because of, of COVID-19, it meant that Brexit happened in the interim. Now, if the MDR had been implemented last year before Brexit, then it would have been adopted into UK law, in which case the UK would be following the medical device regulation. And actually that would have made sense <laughs> because um, the MHRA, which is the main regulatory body, the competent authority in the UK, was a major contributor to the development and the design of the medical device regulation. So here we are now, we have Brexit in the meantime. Today, the medical device regulation is in full force in Europe, but the UK didn't adopt it, didn't put it into UK law. We missed, you could say we missed the boat. So, so we, we said that we are sticking with the medical device directive because it's already part of our law, of the UK law, yeah? Um, yeah. And actually, you know, it, it's okay, 
but because we've had such significant change now that we're now that the UK is a third country, um, it's going to take time for the UK to start developing its own regulatory requirements for for medical devices. But it will happen. And it's anticipated that it will go along the lines of the medical device regulation. But in a way, I think the UK is wanting to make a point and, and stand out by itself. And so I don't think they're going to adopt it 100%. They will develop further develop it. And maybe for things like AI, I mean, there's going to be a new um, regulatory um, structure for artificial intelligence. So maybe the UK regulator will look to actually um, address that um, at the same time, rather bolting, rather than bolting something on in the future. So it, there will be change, but right now it's status quo as the medical as the medical device directive. That's that is that would be interesting to see because when the transition happens, it's it is going to keep the manufacturers in a very confused state. <laughs> so yes, that is going to bring a lot of new challenges in the future. And I, I can see a new comment that has come in. And I guess this is something that not has nothing much to do with MDR. It could be maybe you could use your GRS expertise into this. So somewhere Akash is mentioning about risk management is a critical part as mentioned maybe in the AstraZeneca vaccine. So yes, a lot of focus is being done on the risk management in the MDR. So what do you think, if, uh, will, how is it going to impact further to the manufacturers, maybe not just medical devices, but to overall manufacturers in terms of risk management? Yeah, so there has to be focus on risk management at the outset. It can't be an afterthought. So it's got to be very much an integral part of the research, design and development of your product, whether that's a pharmaceutical or a medical device. So and and it's got to be adopted across the board. So it's going to be a, it, it's 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 almost, I suppose, like a cultural change within a company. So yeah. risk management is very much about part of laying down really good, solid foundations for the success of your company. So it, it's not necessarily product specific. It's actually down to the company. You're not necessarily identifying just the risks associated with that product. It's, you know, it's, it's how you're actually doing the manufacturing, which is why you have quality management systems. Um, it's looking at your supply chain, doing your proper due diligence. You know, what what is the risk? I mean, one of the things that we did discover with, with COVID-19, with the lockdowns, was that, um, for example, the US was so reliant on China for producing its APIs, so active pharmaceutical ingredients for a lot of its um, everyday drugs that people were using. And they realized that the supply chain was being cut off because everyone was being locked down. There was no flying, et cetera, et cetera. So that made the US realize how vulnerable it was and to look to its own manufacturing and say, hey guys, you know, we should be doing this here. And by by developing this network of manufacturing um, that isn't just located in one place, it means you're mitigating the risk and you can continue to supply those pharmaceuticals. And it's the same with medical devices. We've got a classic saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, and that's really, you know, you need to be thinking of the contingency for, for long term success. Yes, so no doubt. Yeah, I can totally understand because we all are witnessing the changes and the implication of risk management because just keeping the pharmaceutical and the medical aside, some or the other where I can feel that there is a lot of risk management needed in any kind of consumer product because towards the end you are playing with the people and the public at large mm -hmm. and any kind of mistake by any of the manufacturer can affect a lot many people all together. So yes, moving on. And in the previous question where I asked you about the UK and the developments in the devices, you mentioned something about AI and uh, something about, and even I mentioned about cybersecurity. So what do you think and how do you think the medtech 
industry is adopting AI and how do you think all of these medical and the technology, how are they going to form a synergy and how do you think they will bring something beneficial in the future? Wow, that's that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I've got to say um, there are several different versions or interpretations of AI, um, but artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's been around, it has been around for a while, but it, it's gaining a lot of traction now. And, I, and I've got to say a lot of it is because of COVID and the way, you know, the situation we all find ourselves in. Um, one of the, the plus points with AI is, um, and, and this actually links very neatly with clinical evidence, is that train it to review all the data around the world in support of your of your drug or your, well, today we're talking about medical devices. So, um, you know, something for a human, I mean, I know it's, humans can scan, read things very quickly, um, but we, we are prone to a misinterpretation as well. So with AI, you can train it to go through all that data and pick out good quality data and use that in support of development of medical devices. So that's one aspect um, and that's saving time. Um, and you're, you're actually getting much better quality data to support your, your devices. The other aspect is healthcare, using artificial intelligence in healthcare that's a very new area and i think and i think that's why we're getting these new uh, this new regulatory structure specific for for ai and you know i mean look at the the old days of star trek and other you know um, science films etc scientific uh, films you know we used to think that was just you know total imagination and complete fiction and and actually a lot of it has almost come it's just about come true you look at things that you can place on your skin um it, you know that can track everything um you know the, the the holograms um you look at surgery and there are surgeons learning from 3d images in in an operating theater i mean it's just phenomenal but it it needs it needs to be developed in a, in a safe and structured way. And you mentioned about cybersecurity. I mean, we should all be very hot about that anyway. But the US FDA, uh, which is the regular, main reg regulator out there, I mean, they really see that as a major, major risk. And this goes back to risk. You know, what is the risk of being attacked? Um, you know, through artificial, artificial intelligence. I mean, we're looking at AI as being very positive, a real benefit to healthcare, to supporting us as patients, as individuals. But if, in the wrong hands, yeah, um, I dread to think. And this is why we have regulations. That's right. So somewhere do you think, can these regulations be a threat or maybe can they be a restraint to the innovation process? <laughs> and do you think that it can, like, do these regulations have a big impact on how these uh, the new products are being developed? I think if you're coming from the point of a of a medical device manufacturer, you see regulations as a restraint, and it's stopping your creativity, your innovation, um, and and you feel like you know the regulators are big daddy, you know, breathing down your neck and saying you can't do this and you can't do that. Um, but there are regulatory authorities out there, um, the HPRA in, in Ireland and the MHRA in the UK, who are wanting to support companies and to help them. They're not big daddy, but at the same time, they want to obviously protect patients and individuals. We're all patients at, at some point, aren't we? If a company is, is clever, they can actually create a regulatory strategy which will underpin and ensure the success of their company. You can actually use it, use it to your advantage and be ahead of all your competitors. So, you know, getting the right regulatory advice and the right regulatory specialists to help you develop that regulatory strategy, I, you know, that is such a fantastic investment. Don't see it as a cost. It really is an investment. 
Right. So I have some people from the audience who are mentioning that, yeah, AI is a new technology for the benefits of humankind. No doubt with that. So because of the AI and analysis, we were able to also manage the pandemic in a very efficient manner. And that is what even Akash highlights today that AI plus analysis gave us the COVID insights. And maybe I feel if this was out of the digital era or if the pandemic would have and have it happened without the digital era we would be so not connected and not updated with the latest trends so yes ai and all the regulations in the right hands is important and that is how the health of the public can be benefited in a very great way and also i guess we are just about to end the session because that's the time that we are buzzing at. <laughs> so before before we try to wind up session, I have two very strategic and very focused questions that I always ask to any of my interviewees, wherein I asked them about one, what is the key takeaway for the people, the entire audience right now? So. And the second question will be followed by the answer. So the very first question for you towards the end of this of the entire seminar or the session that we are hosting right now is that what is the key takeaway and what should the people or our audience at a whole, at a large focus on and what would be your advice for the people out there who, is, who are listening to us? Yeah, I. the key takeaway is don't if you're a, a medical device manufacturer or someone working within a medical device company don't think that the regulations are all about the device yeah. it's actually the company and this is what the new regulation is about is developing the right company culture in order to innovate design develop commercialize the medical devices which are going to be used for patients for healthcare. So that's the key takeaway. It's it's look at it as a company culture and it should be embraced. Okay, so yes, the, that was a message for the medical device or medical or people in the medical industry. But now the next question, which I feel has various different answers from all the speakers that I have got. So now, since the name of the session is Let's Talk, and I always try to focus the answers towards Gen Z and enlightening the upcoming generation. So what type of message do you have for the people or the Gen Z, the incoming generation who are the leaders of tomorrow? Because they are the ones for whom the regulations would be developed. They are the ones who are going to bring this entire world into a very modern and a dynamic era. So just a few, a small gist of takeaway for the Gen Z or maybe the incoming generation who will take the power at church. Yeah, so I would say, don't think of regulations as a necessary evil. Embrace them, read them, learn about them and learn how you can work within that structure but at the end of the day we're not it's not all about the word it's not all about technology it's not all, all about um you know the, the clinical trials and everything else that you need to do you're actually dealing with people never lose sight of the fact that you're dealing with people so the end point is actually the patient and then work yeah. back from that so think of yourself as a patient what would you like to see, you know, how would it build confidence in you to be using that particular device? Also, the regulators are your friend and make yeah. sure you nurture that relationship and be there to support each other. So don't point the finger of blame or, you, you know, accusation to the regulators and say, why can't I do this? Actually go to them and say, this is what I would like to do and and these are the reasons why do you agree with me enter into a dialogue with them and you will find them really supportive so they really are your friends but yeah. remember that they're looking after people's safety at the same time right yes totally i can agree with that so i i can i just before we wind up we have some 
good amount of mentions. So uh, we have Eva or Eva. I hope I am not taking the name wrong. So she uh, that she did say that yeah, your takeaways are very important and they are rarely said. So yes, the takeaways are important for everyone, irrespective of the age, irrespective of the generation you belong to. We all should be considered. We all should collaborate, and that's what even this session is all about. Because with your comments, we uh, we both talking and the comments of the audience, I am sure a very great session and insights were developed for all of them. So yes, we have a lot of positive feedback. So this gives me confidence that I'm going to go LinkedIn Live soon with some, with another topic very very com coming very quick, especially maybe in the next month. So yes, people are excited to know more about Gen Z. The Gen Z is out there listening and supporting us. And I see Sakshi is mentioning that when you learn and when you evolve and you grow together. So yes, that is what is needed in current days. The more we collaborate, the more we learn. And yeah, <laughs> the comments are coming in. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, we will be conducting more sessions like this. But now it's time to wind up this particular session, wherein we were exploring MDR and explaining it in a very simple terms to the generation out there, to Gen Z, to millennials, and to everyone uh, attending this session. Because yeah, my our networks who are viewing and the audience, it's grand. So yes, thank you all for all your support that you are showing. Because of you, I was able to make this session. And because of this session, we got a very insightful speaker like Greer Deal, who mentioned a lot many takeaways for the AU MDR. So stay tuned with us. And yeah, thank you, Greer, once again for mm -hmm. taking this time because I believe that it was a great opportunity. We have built a very strong network because the audience is loving it. And this indirectly is going to empower all of us. It is going to build a very big network of empowerment. So yes, with that message and on that positive note, let's just take a leave for today. Thank you everyone for joining in, in today's session. And thank you once again, Greer, for giving your insights and takeaway. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome. Bye. -bye. Welcome. Bye.